It's time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor and analyst, and Mr. Hardy Burt, author and correspondent. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Lord Birdwood, one of Great Britain's most discerning writers on international affairs. Lord Birdwood, our viewers are tremendously interested in the Middle East today. And you, sir, I believe, have made, uh, have served at least something like 16 tours of duty over there during your adventurous lifetime. So I'm certain that we would like to have some of your expressions tonight, sir. First of all, uh, it's true, isn't it, sir, that uh, Western prestige, that is the influence of both Britain and America, has been deteriorating in the Middle East for some time now, hasn't it? Yes, I'm afraid, Mr. Huey, that's probably true. I think it dates back to um, World War I, probably. In other words, since uh, the end of the First War, why our prestige, our influence in the Middle East has been progressively going down. Now, sir, uh, recently, this week, we heard of, uh, of this uh, agreement that's just been reached between Britain and Egypt relating to the Sudan. Mm. And some Americans feel that maybe this, this uh, means a reversal of that loss of prestige, and they regard this as a very hopeful thing. Now, first of all, can you tell our viewers just what the Sudan is? Well, yes, I welcome this chance, <coughs> because I think probably the world regards our association with the Sudan as just another kind of imperial adventure. It has been a British colony, has it? Or no, sort of British no colony? it's been a condominium, a government of one country by two, ever since 1899. But by natural processes, the fact remains that uh, Britain has taken a major share in the development Now, where of is the Sudan? It's south of Egypt? The Sudan is an enormous <coughs> tract of country, about a million square miles. I don't know how that compares with anything in America. I don't know, I'd well like to know how, how it compares, for instance, with with Texas over well, it's even Kelsey. bigger than Texas. Uh, <laughs> well, what, what is the importance of Sudan to the British in particular? Why, why is it important to them? Um, first of all, there's a, a perfectly normal material interest. Uh, the Sudan depends upon a cotton, a cotton economy. The cotton of the Sudan is its wealth. And that cotton, <coughs> of course, is linked very co closely to our um, Lancashire cotton industry. Well, now, I understand after about three years that Sudan will be given an opportunity to uh, more or less declare its freedom from both uh, Egypt and Britain. Does that mean that you're going to lose a great share of that cotton? Or what is, you're going to lose anything there? Well, it very much depends. Um, I would answer that in these terms. After three years, as I see it, the Sudan is going to give them a choice. It's going to be able to say whether it wants to continue in complete independence, uh, or whether it wants some kind of association with Egypt, or, and this is not entirely clear, uh, whether it wants to um, have an association with Great Britain. Well, why are you, are you pressured to get out of the Sudan with Egypt? Did you have to do it? What was the reason for getting out? Well, <coughs> I think we would possibly, uh, mind you, all the time I would emphasize this, that I'm uh, only <coughs> expressing entirely my own view. It would be not quite fair to say that what uh, I, uh, uh, the views I express are necessarily Her Majesty's government. I am expressing my own view. Now, we in Britain, as I see it, regarded the Sudan, although it is a condominium, as our most uh, successful and magnificent uh, experiment in colonialism. Uh, we started with a community, a community from scratch, a semi-nomadic people. Uh, and we have raised them now uh, to uh, the level where they are able to choose well, uh, their the own destiny. The importance at the moment of the Sudan, sir, is this. Britain and Egypt have been disputing over it for many years, and now this week, apparently some agreement has been reached between the two countries. The, the big, big thing now is agreement. 
Now, do you think that that agreement will, will lead, perhaps, to an agreement on, on the Suez Canal area? I would say that if there has been real agreement, yes, obviously, psychologically, it paves the way for um, a very happy background to a further negotiation in regard to the defense. Well, you have, about, you have about 50,000 troops now guarding yes, the canal, have, have yes. you? And, and Egypt wants you to move them. Yes. Is the worldwide significance of this uh, uh, new policy and uh, agreement in Sudan really mean that uh, you will have better control of the Suez area now? Is that the real meaning of it from a worldwide standpoint? No, no, no. Uh, uh, may I explain this? That the Egyptians have always in the past, up till the advent of Nagin, uh, been insistent that both the Sudan and the defense of the area based on the canal should be treated as one problem. Now for the first time Nagib has been prepared to recognize them as two separate problems. And therefore, if we have negotiated uh, an agreement with Egypt over the Sudan, it quite obviously paves the way for um, uh, presenting a favorable background for negotiation on the other issues. Well, now, do you want to, does Britain want to continue to keep those 50,000 troops uh, in the canal area, sir? Now, I'm speaking only for myself when I say just this. The British taxpayer is paying nine and sixpence income tax in the pound. The canal is not a very salubrious kind of climate. It's not the kind of climate the British soldier would choose if he had his choice. I would say that if the North Atlantic <coughs> Treaty powers we're prepared to recognize what we would say would be the creation of a strategic vacuum in this very important area. Britain would find it very difficult to be able to, uh, to, to wish to continue to, to keep troops there. No, you, d does that mean, sir, that you'd like for us to send some troops over mm -hmm. there to help you police that area? I think we would. I think we regard this uh, issue of the defense of the Middle East as uh, an international, more particularly a North Atlantic Treaty responsibility. As Premier Naguib of Egypt, uh, I, my understanding is that he's uh, very sympathetic to the British cause in as much as keeping British troops in the Suez area. Is that correct? I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that because, uh, after all... More sympathetic than the previous governments. So. Oh, yes, undoubtedly. Undoubtedly much more, uh, much more logical and rational to, to, to deal with. And, of course, he's a soldier and presumably, therefore, understands the problem, the defense of the area as a soldier. Well, hoping, sir, that we are making some progress in Egypt, let's move on to that other emotional issue, the problem of, uh, of Israel. <laughs> now, first of all, sir, how do you interpret the new anti-Semitic tactic of the of the Russian government. Is it going to be effective and difficult for us to combat in that area? Well now, Mr. Huey, let's first of all get clear our ideas about the motive uh, behind it. I personally don't believe that there's a kind of studied, extremely skillful um, um, process of uh, winning over the Arab world uh, as, pri as the priority objective. I think it's obvious that Israel and Zionism and uh, Jewry all over the world represents that one uh, remaining bridge between the Iron Curtain and the West. Um, I think that that being so, the Soviet uh, would, wish to, would wish to close that bridge. And what more uh, reasonable from their point of view, therefore, <laughs> that they should uh, um, uh, turn to a policy of anti-Semitism, completely closing uh, any possibility of uh, um, communication one way, or one way or the other. Is it the that only the priority. <coughs> now, I'd add to that, of course, in doing so, they're perfectly prepared to cash in uh, on um, uh, the obvious attractions that that kind of policy has for the Arab world. <laughs> now, Is sir, it the feeling in Britain, would you say, uh, Lord Birdwood, that the uh, Arabs are right and Israel is wrong in their disputes? I think the feeling in Britain is uh, that um, uh, the Arabs have had um, an unfair deal. Um, I know from my studies of past history uh, that um, Arab confidence uh, has been lost in international negotiation that dates back to World War I, from the time of broken pledges to the Arabs, 
And um, very unfortunately, that kind of situation has been inherited well, today see, by the United Nations. And obviously siding with, uh, is, uh, against Israel and with the Arabs, do you think that the Soviet Union has any long-range plan in the Middle East? Um, well, now, if I could answer that, I might probably be <laughs> Foreign Secretary. <laughs> but um, I would say this. Uh, it was expressed to me in terms of a man who knows more about the oil in the Middle East than probably uh, most. He would say this, that oil is a wasting asset in America. Oil is an increasing asset in the Middle East. <coughs> the Soviets are short of oil. The last published figures um, they gave were 52 million tons. Well, 52 million tons isn't really quite enough uh, for their objectives. It's uh, um, not very much more than what the Aramco company is turning out on its own. Well, well. Therefore, about 300 miles away from the Soviet curtain, we have the richest prize in peace or war that any aggressor could wish for. Surely, uh, perhaps, the future of the Middle East is uh, to be dictated by that kind of situation. Who is going to own that oil? Is it going to be by an aggressive process, uh, either physical or um, political? Well, sir, I'm sure that our viewers have appreciated these expressions from you tonight, sir, and thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. <laughs> the opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Hardy Burt. Our distinguished guest was Lord Birdwood of Great Britain. Over the years, there have been made, under the most difficult conditions, hundreds of practical tests of the durability and dependability of Longines watches. Now, one such test was the recent Paul Emile Victor Arctic expedition of 1949-1950 on which we've just received a detailed report. 34 members wore Longines watches continuously, including two months on the great polar ice cap in temperatures ranging from 44 degrees above to 60 degrees below zero. One watch stopped momentarily at 68 degrees below, but started again when warmed in the hands. Now the accuracy of the 34 Longines watches throughout the expedition can only be described as remarkable. A few of the Longines watches which you see here will be called upon to withstand a life so rugged, but all Longines watches, regardless of type, are made with such meticulous care that under all ordinary circumstances they will deliver in full measure the greater accuracy, the unfailing dependability, and the long years of service which are built into them. And the satisfaction that comes from owning a Longines watch is priceless. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us. Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longine and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longine Whitnor watches. Challenging Entertainment, Omnibus, on the CBS Television Network.